My name is Werner Herzog. I'm a filmmaker. And it is a pleasant privilege for me to introduce Falling or conduct the Q&A with the main participants. Um, but I would like to say why I'm, I uh, agreed to do this. I've seen, as the Oscar season is, uh, I've seen quite a few films and almost all of them uh, disappear very quickly. They vanish. Uh, you uh, forgot what was the title of it, what was the story of the film. Uh, they disappear. But this is one of the films falling um, by Viggo Mortensen. That's a film that lingers. It, it really settles somehow in your mind and clings to you. And it's a great privilege for me to introduce the filmmaker Viggo Mortensen. Uh, Vigo is not only the writer and director, he plays the protagonist, he composed the music and just as a few additional informations, he's a photographer, a poet, a musician, a painter. In one of the films, I think, uh, where there are paintings in the background, so I don't even know which one it was, uh, all the paintings in the background are yours. So uh, it's kind of astonishing and, of course, uh, it... Uh, will be important to have your opinions and your take on the on the whole subject and, and everything. I, I equally uh, am pleased to introduce Laura Linney. Laura, of course, is also very well known to Academy members. Uh, she has gotten three Academy nominations, like uh, Vigo, for example. And uh, what uh, probably some of the audiences do not know is that Laura uh, is, is really very, very well known as a singer. She has been on Broadway. Here we are talking about movies, but I'm always astonished at how, how well you find the right tone, the emotional tone, the, the intelligence of your voice. So that's, that's something, and of course, uh, uh, Laura has received Golden Globes, Emmys, Tonys, uh, you just name it, uh, doctorates, uh, honorary doctorates, and so on. Um, Lance, who plays the father in the film, who is uh, one of the two big, big uh, figures that sticks in, in my mind, of course, is not made of the stuff to receive doctorates. I would like to introduce him, of course, uh, Lance Hendrickson, has uh, become quite uh, known, well known through the Alien franchises, franchise through Terminator and many other films, huge amount of films. But um, what um, I would like to point out, what strikes me is apparently Lance uh, had a very troubled childhood. Uh, growing up in foster homes, getting in trouble, uh, joining, uh, joining the Navy or, or the American Marine, and um, for his first film role from a tape, you apparently learned the entire screenplay, all parts of everyone in the screenplay, because of what you had had only one year, I think, in school. You left school after first grade and you were an illiterate by the age of 30, an illiterate. illiterate. And because of that, you learned all the roles of every single person in the movie. So of course you are beyond that. And, and I, I say that because I have very, very high esteem of those who cannot read and write because they have to develop a very specific intelligence to read the signs correctly anyway. How do you read street signs? How do you find your way in the world that is complicated? So, um, and for example, among the illiterates, you have the greatest storytellers, those who, who memorize epic poetry, uh, 800 pages by heart. So you're, you're one of those. Um, and I salute you. I salute you as, as, as a former illiterate. So I'm very honored. I'm very honored to see a man like this on, on a screen together with us. So, Vigo, uh, to you, it's uh, a film that uh, is painful because it is so truthful. It has this kind of 
very, very almost agonizing presence that you hardly ever see in the film. And it is so truthful and so beautiful because I, th I have a suspicion, could it be that part of it or the whole story is based on personal experience? Because you have written the screenplay. It's your child. Yes. Um, well, thank you for everything you've said. <clears throat> You're very kind. Um, yeah, the story of falling was a story I started writing after my mother died. Uh, and she had had dementia, like Lance Henriksen's character in the, in the movie. Um, and I began, I just wanted to remember things about her when she died, stories I knew about her, her image, you know, uh, things I remembered from my childhood and adolescence. And of course, in, in the more recent past, the dementia, the illness, which is, I've seen a lot of in, in our family. My father had it as well, stepfather, grandparents, many people on both sides of the family. So I started out, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to write something that had to do with my feelings from my mother. As I kept writing, I guess I felt freer making up a family, making up a story, inventing a story, a fictional story, and um, that, that was centered around uh, the relationship primarily between a father and a son, but also father-daughter. My sister in the movie is, is Laura, play, is played by Laura. And, but, the, but, but it's still at the heart of the story for me uh, is the mother. She's sort of the emotional connection for everyone. She's the conscience in a way of the story. She's what they argue about. <laughs> She's what they clash over. And so it's more just like memory. I think memory is subjective. It's more a collection of feelings than facts. And so this movie is about my feelings for my mother and my father. And I guess what I've learned from them put into a, a fictional story. And uh, how painful, if I may be so direct, how painful has been uh, this kind of life, this period in your life where your mother started to develop dementia, your father, everyone around, of the, of the older ones. Well, and, and you were responsible in a way. Well, I, my brothers also were helping, but it's true. In, in recent years, you know, with, especially with my parents, both my mother and father, I, I, I was in a caregiving role a lot and I, I saw it up close. And, you know, you just have to new, develop new communication skills. I mean, in a way, all your friends, anybody you care about, you should be aware of them and be flexible and serve them. If it's your friend, you should serve that person in a way. Go where they feel comfortable. Try to meet them somewhere that's comfortable. That's certainly true of people with dementia, but I think it should be about anybody. I, I mean, nobody made me tell this story. I wanted to keep that flame alive or, or that wound open, uh, my feelings for my mother and my father. Um, but especially her. And so this is why I guess I wrote it in some way, um, subconsciously. And I'm happy I did that because I kept this wound open by writing it, by preparing the story, yeah. by, by, by shooting it, by editing it, and now talking about it. I'm glad, but it's blended. Other people's stories have mixed in the fictional characters, the comments that Laura made or Lance made or people in the crew made, what audience have said since, it's all part of my family memories now, this larger family. And I, I wanted to keep that sometimes painful, but sometimes yeah. uh, joyful um, set of feelings alive. You know? But it is a lesson in humanity That's, that comes across very, very clearly. And uh, uh, I think uh, something like this we have not seen yet. And I'm, I'm very glad that this film is out just for the sake of uh, technicalities. The film was shown in Sundance almost exactly a year ago. I think Sundance is opening now. It was shown in Sundance, mm -hmm. uh, was very well received, but uh, it it seems to be opening in theaters, in real theaters with real audiences, not only in the mm. virtual world, in the cloud, so to speak. Uh, when is it opening? 
It opens next Friday in the United States and Canada, Friday the 5th of February. It has opened in other countries, in Europe, and uh, the earliest place was Spain, and it's still playing in, in cinemas and movie theaters in Spain f- almost four months later. Um, it's kind of like these, the independent film hit of Spain this past year, so I'm very happy about that. It's been a strange year since Sundance last year with the pandemic, just like everybody else who had a movie ready, we've had to be patient and wait. It's taken a long time, but we, we are finally arriving next Friday, the 5th. Yeah. Right. Uh, in, in a way, Vigo, when I look at the film, it feels like a, an actor's, a great actor's movie. So you did the casting, apparently. And can you speak a little bit about Laura and about Lance, how you came across him, what... Uh, what brought you into them? They seem to be such a natural choice. Mm-hmm. So as if there was no one else, as if there were the real, your real uh, Laura, your real sibling, Lance, your real father. It's, um, it's it, there, there's no, no, it seems there was no choice. No other option. Yeah, I thank you. I agree. I For this particular story, everybody in the movie, from the four-year-old boy you know, that plays me when I'm a child yeah. and all the way up to Lance, <clears throat> you know, who's now 80 years old. Every It was the perfect cast. I mean, I couldn't think of anybody that would do any of the roles better. I'm very happy with that. The casting director's name is Deirdre Bowen. They don't, they don't often get mentioned, but she's a very fine casting director in Canada. Laura, yeah. I approached... Uh, just sort of very optimistically saying, you know, it's not uh, one of the leading roles, one of the roles that you see throughout the whole film, but it's a crucial role. It's very important because when John, the character I play, his sister shows up, many more pieces of the puzzle fall into place as to the family dynamic and and the relationship that Willis, the the father played by Lance has with, with everyone in the family. So I needed someone who was just a great actress and I couldn't think of anybody better. So the day that she said, yes, I'll do it. I was jumping up and down. And in fact, I saw Lance and we were so happy that we called her on Skype and introduced, you know, I said, this is your father and you know, we're his kids and it was wonderful. Lance was the first actor cast, you know, years ago. I mean, I started writing this in 2015 and it took two or three tries to get the financing. And Lance fortunately stayed with us the whole way. So I got to know Lance quite well. We got to know each other during those years. We used that time to work on the script and work on the relationship. I wasn't going to be in the movie at first. Uh, Eventually I thought, well, I'll do it because if I do it, then maybe we can attract just enough financing that we're missing. And I also thought I could continue the relationship that I was developing with Lance and not just be the director trying to help create an atmosphere where he could do his best work. But I would also be in the fight with him. I would be as an equal, as an actor trying to solve problems, difficult scenes together. So I was very happy that I'm so glad that both of of them agreed to do it. Uh, Laura, how much... How much of your own is in this film? I mean, actors like Lance or you are Vigo, you are the, in a way, the architects, the inner architects of your roles. Uh, how uh, Explain a little bit the collaboration because you are in the same frame with the man Vigo, who is also, so to speak, behind the camera, the director. How much freedom? Please explain a little bit. I'm very curious. Well, I think, you know, it, it all goes to a very well-written script or a script that points you in the direction of uh, the core of what it is, the marrow of the story, which for me is about connection and the sort of archetypal desire for connection that we all have with parents who most of the time are difficult <laughs> and don't necessarily deserve the love that we have for them. They can try and beat us away with sticks and we still love them. And we still need their love and seek their love. And, and I think that's, that's something you don't have to scratch terribly deeply with anyone to, to find. It's, it's the story that you hear more, more than the opposite, more than the happy, happy, happy family. 
So, you know, for me, there's, there's certainly intersections of, of my life with this story as well. And, and you can, when you read a script as an actor, you can see the truth within it because it, it makes the script then actable. A lot of scripts are, are written and they're written to be greenlit, but they're not written to be acted or to actually turn into... Yeah, you are referring, you, Laura, I, I know exactly you are referring to those synthetic characters yeah. uh, that, that are taught in screenwriting classes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Character development and you have these yellow pads on the wall and you endow the figure with one more quality and to make the the, the person sweet she she had a, she has a little pup dog that yeah. reflects the sweetness of her to her and and things like that so uh, you you see it against uh, you see it through the densely planted hedges you see it hiding everywhere so and but but here the roles are uh, there's something authentic something truthful yes yes and then there's also and you have to the, discover it yeah yes and there's also then the skill underneath it which is the testament to to vigo that there's actually purpose to it so there's not just connection but there's narrative and there's flow and there's pace and it's it is crafted to work it's not it's not just an expression of emotion or a sort of indulgent expression of desire or yearning or um, timbre of the heart or anything like that. But there is there is a story and a narrative that 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 moves through. And so if you're uh, you know able to if you're lucky enough to receive a script like this, um, you don't care what the size of the part is. And particularly if it's come from someone whose work you respect as much as I've respected Vigo and. You know, I was just, I was thrilled to be, to be asked to be a part of it. And I, I had a ball. Yeah. Lance, um, for you, of course, uh, you seem to be the naturally born father for, for this part. Uh, it, it is a performance. It is a performance that is unique. We haven't seen something like this in a very long time. I think the Academy should take note. I'm just saying it vaguely. I'm myself um, a member of the Academy and I do take note. Uh, but uh, there's something very bold about it. Really, really bold. Uh, can you explain a little bit about your part and you, uh, your approach into this, into this movie? You know, Vigo <coughs> said something that he's never said before. And that is keep the wounds open. And I really believe that uh, the reason, the reason I connected with it so much is that the, the damage that was caused uh, in my youth, like, like Laura says, you know, we, we're giving love to people that don't deserve it because of the way they treat you and the way they uh, molest you emotionally. You know, they you, they do it from the time you're too small to fight back. And then it becomes part of your personality. I can accept the blows. But someday, I realized it will come out. The, the uh, All the frustrations and the anger and all, all of those things. So they're natural. They're almost like the evolution of uh, what it is to be a human being. You know, we don't <clears throat> we don't have a map. We try, we look for them, but there are none. And and then and then I got into the arts, and I realized these people are kind. They're mostly a searchers for for thoughts and things and deeds. You know, and and I liked it a lot more than natural life. I mean, I like acting as much as anything I've ever done, you know, and it, and it's given me the gift. It's healed me over the years. It's healed me. I can look back and, and understand what that character was they call a mother or a father. You know, I understand it. But here I was. Vigo offered it to me and 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 um, you know, I was nervous naturally. Because if you're going to reveal things, keeping the wounds open is probably uh, 
the most accurate description for what I did, for what I was pursuing. You know, and and you and you get someone like Laura Lindley, who 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 is so well versed. She beams. I mean, it, it comes out of her skin. You know, I found it very difficult to work with her because she uh, <laughs> uh, she uh, she is so uh, pure of heart and everything else. I mean that that I was uh, I could hardly look at her and talk to her. <laughs> You have to, yes, you the, the problem is you have, to be, you have to be so unlikable. I mean, actors are always trying to to look good and look likable and so, but you are the contrary. Uh, it's it's an antagonist's part uh, that carries, in in a way, carries a film and and gives a dynamic to the film. But but it is it is a very antagonistic approach. And and uh, you are as bad as it gets, as, as a father. And uh, <laughs> I really always had the feeling that there must be some sort of a of a deep echo of something in you that starts ringing like bells, distant bells in you that that starts that start vibrating, and and you get you get into your tirages, uh, you get into your into your wild rants uh, is, is some of it some of it sounds as if it was somehow almost invented in the scene itself not not always word by word uh, uh, texts that you learned it's true I have to admit it it's true I I couldn't I didn't want to get caught out I just wanted to live it And I did it as yeah. much as I could, as much as I was capable of, you know what I mean? Yeah. I never caught you during the shoot. He would say that all the time. Don't let me caught act, get caught acting. Whatever happens, that's the most important thing. And I said, having seen your work, I don't think that's going to happen. And I never saw that during the shoot. I never saw it in the editing room. It was always real to me as real as you could get making believe i mean it however you got there you were present and you never played for the sympathy of the audience you played what needed to be played and did much more than i dreamed was possible with the role so thank you for that yeah lance and vigo there's one culminating scene where you get into a into a real physical confrontation And it is it, it is where where the character of Vigo uh, talks back and shouts back, and I I had the feeling this cannot be fully act be it's not fully acted. There's something authentic about it, and and probably you can't rehearse it much. You have to do it, and and you cannot repeat it very often. You see that the the, the camera sometimes switches, so you you must have restarted some of it from a certain moment on but things like that cannot be fully rehearsed the texts cannot be fully scripted how how did that work for you lance i i i have been i had a, a quite a few stepfathers i had like four of them five of them mm -hmm. and i remember one of them who was came out of the second world war and he was he was PTSD, nobody even knew what that word was. And I remember I, I, him and my mother had a big fight and he was left at the bar and she came running home and sliced up the whole house with a knife. I mean, the, the, we had nothing anyway, but she would cut up the couch and tore the curtains down and I was five. So it was a terrifying sight. You know, she was taking it out on the house because she couldn't do it with him. This guy was six five and a Russian uh, extract guy. And but anyway, I wired the doorknob shut because she said, "Keep him out." And I'm five. I didn't know how to do it. I mean, I took a piece of wire and wrapped it around. And, and uh, of course, when he came home, he just opened the door and he said, "Who put the wire on the door?" And I said, "I did." And he punched me in the back and knocked me across the whole room. 
and it hurt. I mean, I thought he broke my back. I mean, he was such a big guy. But anyway, I'm bringing up that story only because I'm not afraid of fighting. In fact, a lot of my trouble when I was in my teens and so on, when I joined the military, I joined the military at 16. And then after recruit training, 15 weeks of that, I, I, they asked me if I wanted to stay in. And stupidly, I said yes. But anyway, anyway. Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that violence to me, it will only end if I'm knocked out. I mean, it, it's in me. I have a violent place in me, but acting channel that. It's not like, it's not like, I don't feel afraid of any emotion anymore. I mean, I'll go to any lengths, even if I have to run naked through a Walmart. I don't give a shit. I mean, it's really about, did I say that? And yes, that's great. It's really, sorry, <laughs> it could get worse. But, but, but the point is that it's a gift that was given to me that healed me better than any therapist could. Because hmm. I don't trust So uh, Lance, acting, becoming an actor has been a great blessing for you. Oh, totally, totally. It made me look at other okay. people, really see them, really feel them. I will I say that, down, you know, huh? I will say that, that Lance, like I say, all the things I've seen him do, it doesn't matter what the movie is or how um, unusual the genre is or how long he's in the movie. My attention goes to him because he is committed to whatever the truth of that character is. I, I don't catch him acting. I mean, that's why I hoped that he would want to play Willis. And I have to say that scenes, including the one you referred to, Werner, that, that where they finally go at each other, it was wild. And we had to catch our breath and we put off, we had rehearsed it and maybe too much in a way. And when we started shooting that scene, we were standing outside while they were, we were, they were changing a lens and on the camera. And we went outside and Lance said, how do you think it's going? And I said, it's going, it's working. We're doing the right things as the moment start, you know, as it starts to build the scene, you know, the antagonism, it's, it's correct. But I don't think correct is gonna cut it with this scene. This scene has to be out of control. It has to be uncomfortable, ideally for the audience. So we need to be uncomfortable. And we, uh, we stopped filming that day. It was the only day we did that. We had a very tight schedule. We didn't have the luxury of reshooting anything so we just stopped where we were at we got to that point before it really blows up and we took a day and a half off and i directed some other scenes where i didn't have to act and lance didn't have to act and we just decided we've prepared it too much let's forget about it and let's come back friday morning and let's just put it all on the table you know and that's what happened and that day was very different and it was scripted actually and it's a tribute to lance <laughs> how much feeling, how much reality, all these things that you were, whatever you were thinking of, Lance, whatever you brought from your life, whatever was inside you, you put that into the scene in a way that it feels like we, in a way, I guess it looks like we improvised the whole thing, but we didn't really. I mean, it was, it was what we were going to do. It was just the feelings were quite real. It, it was uncomfortable. It was, uh, and it was a turning point for this movie because it was in the, first week and after that scene the crew was with us they were crying they were attached to the story in a way in a different way now you remember that lance i mean they were just and the rest of the way we felt like it's great for for actors and it's also great for a director to feel like the, for the crew it's not just another job that emotionally they are with you and and feeling it you know and it was it was a really uh that was a transformative day when we got into that really got into that scene i i'm i'm not sure if it was us or all we did was open up memories in their life that they were crying about you yeah. know they they were weeping i mean it was it was so crazy because i turned around the corner after 
and they were video village watching because they all wanted to see what was going to happen. And there were there were people wiping the tears out of their eyes. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it was one of those acting world moments when something really works, whether you're doing a play or a movie or whatever it is, and you see a genuine reaction from the people around you. That's what it's all about. It's like a family of love, man. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, where, where you transcend uh, dialogue, where you ex uh, uh, transcend choreography of a fight, where you transcend the movie set situation. Yeah. And in a way, Laura, I had the feeling with, with you as well, when you are when you are so deeply insulted and so hurt, uh, it this kind of hurt comes across from you to the audience. And how much, I, I think this is not professional anymore. It's not playing to be hurt. Can you explain how far you would, you would sense it and go into it and how far you would step beyond the role itself? Well, it's sort of nothing that you can uh, tell yourself to do. It's, it's in reaction to what is around you and what is supporting you. And there's a wonderful moment. It doesn't happen all the time. But when, when work comes up off the page, when you're not trying to please anyone, when it takes on a life of its own, and you just get in the current and it will take you. And if everything is in the right place, if I've done my work, as an actor, if the director has prepped me correctly, if the set is appropriate, if the, you know, if it's all sort of, if it's all working to help me out, all I have to do is look at Lance and listen to Lance. And he, he's doing the work for me, really. <laughs> I mean, I just try to get out of my own way, honestly. You know, there's, you, you, you give yourself all the tools that you need and then you get out of your own way and you let, you let the work you let the work do it. It's a it's a strange thing. You have to be very very prepared, and then you have to let it all go. Yeah. And trust that it yeah. will that it will take care of you, and it will and and you really you're serving the story. So as long as your attention is on that and on the person who you're looking at, you you let the story do the work. Yeah. Wow. And Vigo, how much do you have to explain as a, a director? How much do you advise? How much do you somehow play uh, the emotions or prepare the emotions? How do you work as, a, as an actor director? To, with the actors, you mean? With the actors, yes, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, the people that I've worked with that I really like the way they have directed me have been directors who, unless it's absolutely necessary, stay out of the way. <laughs> You know, obviously you explain how you want to do certain moves. There's certain scenes like the long scene at the table with the whole family. This is a very long scene with uh, young actors and it's a long scene and we didn't have much time to shoot it. So that one we really did rehearse, you know, properly as much as we could before we shot it because we need to have the cues and there was a camera movement. It was very specific the way we wanted to do it. So we did work on that a lot, but so much of it is, is who you cast in the roles. And, and then you should have confidence in what your, what your decisions have been in casting. And I'm always open, you know, that's another thing I've learned from, from the best directors is a good idea can come from anybody at any time, no matter how well prepared you are, or how much you've rehearsed or not rehearsed. And so if Lance or Laura had a suggestion to do anything, I was open to it. It would only, I would only step in with any of the actors, including the kids, the small children. Sometimes I had to guide them a little bit more, but I would only step in and interfere, so to speak, if it seemed necessary. You know, I, I preferred to let, I assumed that people would be prepared. I could see that they were and that the role meant something to them. And they had, they knew more about the part than I did who had written them. I could see that. And they were giving me more than I bargained for. It was on very rarely if something was 
I just wanted to try something different to have that as an option in the editing room. I might ask Lance, well, let's try it this way or, or let's do it again, but let's, you know, maybe the reason that line's not working is because it's not good. Let's try it without those two words or those three words, little things like that. But generally I, I, I try to, to trust the actors and it was more about me listening to them and watching them than it was them listening to me and watching me. I think it, that's the way it should work, ideally. There's also something really um, wonderfully um, stealth about this movie as far if you're an actor in it, because I had another actress playing me as an earlier age, so I just got to capitalize on everything she had done, <laughs> quite frankly. The result of, of whatever you saw at that table um, of me being hurt, you're going to feel the echo from the scenes that had happened prior. And the whole movie sort of does that. It all sort of, you know, dovetails into each other. There's a slipstream sort of feeling about the whole thing where uh, time sort of melds from present to past to, and so everyone, everyone's performances, I think, benefit from that. Yeah, it's true. And it was true of the actor Sverrier Gunnarsson, who plays Lance when he was younger as well. You know, obviously, the, the, the actresses playing Laura younger and the actress playing me younger, they, they informed what we were and informed the audience. There were things that we didn't even have to inform anybody about. They were just there already established, as you say, Laura. But, but it was Sverrier and Lance got together many months before we started shooting. And they just read the script together and talked and recorded each other. So Sverrier could especially have these tapes and think about it because he had to be what the beginning of what Lance would become. They were the same person. There had to be this fusion. And it happened in a beautiful way. I didn't have to say much of anything. I could see them starting to resemble each other in the way they walked, like a younger version of Lance's walk, uh, the way they looked at people, the way they reacted. It was, it was very subtle and it was beautiful to watch the actors do that. You know, They, they served each other in a way to play this same man. And Vigo, what I really like about this is um, you, you do some very beautiful casting. It's very, very solid and good. And uh, is it correct that many of the actors came from Canada? Almost uh, all. Because of the film was shot in Canada. And all of a sudden you have a, a treasure trove, a cornucopia of very <laughs> fine actors. And it's the same, for example, I worked once in Louisiana, um, bad lieutenant. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it was surprising how phenomenal the, the, the pool of actors was there uh, for all sorts of roles. So the pool of technical um, uh, collaborators, camera people, sound people, gaffers, you just name it. So it's uh, we, it's good that uh, we have to think beyond Los Angeles. There's yeah. great, great, great uh, New York, for example, Canada now, Louisiana, you, you name it. But you yeah. uh, worked in a lot in uh, Canada for this. Yeah, we shot... Can you explain a little bit? We shot almost all of the movie there. And by because of the co-production deal, it was a Canadian-European co-production. And the actors had to be either, except for the two, um, we got permission to have two with US passports and that was Laura and Lance. <laughs> and I have also Danish citizenship. So I, I, I was officially a Dane as director, actor, everything. And the rest had to be let, Canadian. Let a question, Vigo. I would like to interrupt you because I've always been curious what is your mother tongue? You grew up in four or five languages, Danish, uh, Spanish, Venezuela, Argentina. You grew up uh, New York. Uh, what, uh, you, in which language do you dream, for example? What's your mother tongue? Uh, well, I dream in different ones. It depends a little bit where I am and where I have been during the daytime for, for a period. But uh, okay. I, grew, I grew up simultaneously with English and Spanish and hearing my father speak Danish. And then that came third. I sort of picked that up as I went along. Um, but yeah, and, and so, but going back to the, the Canadian, I mean, it was, it was, it was, no, 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 it was fine. It was in no way a limitation. 
for them to say, well, you, you have to just find everyone in Canada at all. I mean, it was, there was amazing amount of good actors, as you say, and we didn't have the money to fly actors in from Europe, really. We only had one, and that was Sverrier, who's Icelandic. Um, but the kids that, I mean, I, I enjoyed that casting process so much. And, you know, like all of us, I've been on the receiving end of, you know, what it's like to go to try to get a part, you know, hundreds of times, maybe thousands, I don't know, from the beginning, you know, just trying, trying. And you learn from each audition. You have to learn to have a thick skin, but also keep open emotionally. It's a tricky balance, um, frustrating sometimes, difficult. But, um, and you have to just be flexible, really. You're going to deal with different kinds of casting people, directors. Some are unfeeling or don't know how to talk to people. Some are great. And, you know, the casting process, I really enjoyed meeting each of the many kids that we saw and, 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 and thinking, oh, this could work and that could also work. And it was difficult decisions to make. Um, we were lucky. It, it worked out really well, but we, we worked hard at it. And Deirdre Bowen, the casting director, she's uh, from Canada and she was wonderful. She brought in so many great, great actors. We go one more thing because uh, I keep wondering, you actually composed the music for the film yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, it, the soundtrack will be released or has it been released? Um, speak a little bit about the music, your affinity to music. Um, soundtrack will be released tomorrow, actually, or I think uh, midnight tonight, LA time, but tomorrow on or, I don't know what, iTunes and all that, lots of, it's called Music for, Music for Falling. Um, and it's the soundtrack that you hear, the movie, but some of the pieces are a bit longer because I compose things and then fit yeah. them to the scenes. I, again, I mean, I wasn't intending to act in the movie. I wasn't thinking about the music until we were frustrated and couldn't find the money. So some years went by and I kept working with Lance and I, I used the time. I was like, well, where would we shoot this? And, and what kind of crew? And, you know, I just worked on it. And one of the things I started thinking about was the music because I have recorded music over the years and with this same musician that I worked with for this score for 20, 25 years, I think we've been working together. I had a lot of experience editing and mixing music. I had no experience editing images, but I found it was, I don't know how you had so much experience in it. I, I found it was very similar because you have to look at the images a lot until you get to know them and they will tell you how long the shot should be or if it's necessary or what the combination, what the rhythm, it's all tempo, rhythm, timing, just like with music. I found it very similar in a way. And uh, yeah, so, we, so we, by we, the time we finished we, editing, I, I had the, pardon me? We go create, sometimes music creates spaces yeah. and it creates inner yeah. spaces as well. And that's a very tricky thing. How do you do that? And uh, did, did you have any formal training in music or how did you get into this? I always liked, uh, my grandmother had a piano and I would play it when I went to her house and I like to play the piano and whenever I see one in a hotel or somewhere and they let you, I like to play, but I, I'm not a trained musician, but I like it. I like, I like playing music and I like, you know, the experience, like, like acting when it works, there's nothing better. And, and playing music with musicians, especially when they're really good ones, it's, you forget everything else. Time is, is not linear. It's not, it doesn't even exist. You're just really in a place or many places and you travel. Just like when, when acting's working, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's the greatest job in the world. When it's not, It's mm -hmm. one of the most humiliating. <laughs> <laughs> it's really awful. It's, it's awful. Well, right? <laughs> man, when it's clicking, right? Like what Laura was talking about earlier, when, it's, when, it, when you're in the river and you're floating in the river and there's other people in the river with you, it's like, wow. You know, and music is like that. Music is like that. And I really, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, like I say, for this movie, I had time to think about it and compose things before it, during the shoot and during the editing. And when we were finishing the editing, I knew that we were out of money and time basically. 
And, uh, but I didn't need much, you know, in two days, we recorded everything that we had already planned to do. We recorded it, we mixed, mastered it, and boom, that was it. That was our score. I didn't want a, a music that would, any more than the actors or the writing or anything, the camera, I didn't want to tell the audience what to feel or what to think with the music. I wanted the music to be helpful to what, like you say, create certain spaces that wouldn't be there otherwise to a company and sometimes lead the way, but not be dominating, you know, not be instructing you. I, I don't like stories that, that give you answers. I like questions, you know, and that's the kind, I made the kind of movie I'd want to see. I don't right. assume that everybody wants to see it, but yeah. that's, that's what we did. Vico, everything of you is in, in this film. You're writing, you're acting, you're directing, your composition. So I congratulate you for falling. Congratulations you. to you, Laura. Congratulations to you, Lance. Uh, it's a film that sticks to me. And I wish you all the best. Best of luck with the film. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to meet you. Thank <laughs> you.